Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland. I'm Pete Heuser, your president. Today we're going to hear from Maria Idle, who is Vice President of Corporate Responsibility for Nike. She's going to talk to us about the role of corporate citizens in the global marketplace. Our program today is made possible as a result of generous corporate contributions from Washington Mutual Savings Bank, the law firm of Miller, Nash, Wiener, Hager, and Carlson, and Kaiser Permanente. Now, as you know, each of the past few weeks, I've invited a chair of our issue committees to come and talk to us a little bit about what those committees have been doing this year. Today, we're going to have with us Kurt Kraus, who is co-chair of the Business and Technology Issue Committee, take a couple of minutes to tell us about that committee. Kurt? Okay. Excuse me. Well, how fitting that I should be sharing with you today the activities of the Business and Technology Issues Sustainability Goals when we are about to hear about the progress that Nike has made toward using those same principles. The Business and Technology Committee is leading a process to develop a community-wide vision and standards for sustainability for the Portland metropolitan area. We identify sustainability as actions that will sustain our environment as we experience it now for future generations. We're looking toward um, supporting existing sustainability resources and lending our advocacy to actions um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, to, action, to action items that will be accessible to individuals and corporations alike. Our goals are ambitious and our tasks are very important. We regularly meet on the second Thursday of the month at the City Club office with additional sessions as needed. We're a working committee and would welcome anyone who wishes to join us toward these goals. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Now that's the second Thursday you said in the morning? Second Thursday, 7.30. 7.30 in the morning at the club office. Um, we, uh, uh, you'll have to join us next week. Next week on the 26th of March, we're going to have the new TriMet General Manager, Fred Hansen, who's going to talk to us about the new plans for the South North Light Rail. Now, our series of breakfasts with legislators has begun, and there's still limited space available for members only. You can purchase uh, the next three breakfasts, so if you're interested in that, call the club office to hear directly from the legislators as to what's going on in Salem. Our spring series of four programs featuring presentations and hors d'oeuvres by four of Portland's famous chefs is also nearly sold out, so make your reservations soon for that, again, members only. We have a new member in the audience today. I'll ask her to stand. Her name is Isabel Zifkak. She's a sales associate with the Home Journal Network. Isabel, welcome to the City Club. Our board host today sitting at the head table is Sharon Brabenek. Sharon is a, a manager of alumni and donor relations at Merrillhurst. She'll ask the first question and then we'll take questions from City Club members in the audience. We have the mic over here to the side so that you can step right up to the mic during Sharon's question. You don't have to stand back of the room. Let's form a line at the mic. Remember, 30 seconds only for your questions and no more than one question per person, please. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Maria Idle to the City Club. She's relatively new to Nike, having become their VP of Corporate Responsibility only one year ago. She has responsibility for, and this is quite a slate, labor practices and compliance, environmental affairs, and global community involvement. Previously, she worked in community affairs for Microsoft Europe, and unfortunately had to spend four grueling years in Paris. Before that, she was Deputy Director of Media Relations at the White House during the Bush administration. Now, we've certainly heard a lot about Nike for the past year. Last spring, you'll recall that Richard Reed of the Oregonian, who had done a series on Nike's Asian manufacturing plants, talked to us about Nike and the Asian economy. 
Last fall, we hosted Medea Benjamin, who was founder and director of Global Exchange, a watchdog of overseas manufacturing plants for US companies. She told us that Nike had led the way in establishing manufacturing facilities in countries like China, Indonesia, and Vietnam, where low wages combined with repressive governments provided an ideal situation for exploitation of workers. But recently, Nike has taken the lead in forming the Apparel Industry Partnership, a coalition of companies and human rights groups pledged to allow independent monitoring of overseas factories. I'm sure we'll hear more about this movement. Only last week, Nike broke ranks with the rest of the industry and offered to publicly disclose the names and locations of manufacturing facilities. Now, this caused Medea Benjamin to comment, quote, this blows away all the old objections the industry has had. No matter how you look at it, this raises the bar, end of quote. Now, given Benjamin's past attitudes toward Nike, this is a startling change of position. She, uh, uh, and even she concedes that the wind has shifted in Beaverton. Well, I'm anxious to hear about this new effort and other things that Nike might have up his sleeve. Let's welcome Maria Idol to the Portland City Club. Thank you, Peter. Well, as I travel around the world and speak on corporate responsibility issues and discuss them, I can assure you that I get plenty of opinions and lots of great advice about Nike and corporate responsibility. But I don't think there's any better place than to discuss those issues here in our hometown of Portland. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm honored to be here. The City Club is a great institution. And I'm looking forward to sharing thoughts on corporate responsibility and hearing your questions and discussing them today. First, though, in response to City Commissioner Charlie Hales's invitation to move our world headquarters to downtown Portland, I am pleased to announce today that in closed-door negotiations with Nike and the City of Portland, we have come to an agreement to move our campus, lake, soccer field, running path, and the berm to the proposed city expansion site covering the Interstate 405 freeway. <laughs> And if you buy that, I have inside information from the U.S. Weather Bureau that guarantees Portland sunny, warm, 75 degree weather for the next 365 days. So at Nike, we break corporate responsibility down into four areas. Labor practices, community affairs, the environment, and diversity. What distinguishes us for our, from other companies is that we see corporate responsibility as core to our business, not something that we're doing off on the side, but something that's central to everything we do. We have an unwavering commitment to Portland. While we're headquartered in Beaverton, we've always considered ourselves an integral part of Portland and of Oregon. We believe that our corporate responsibility starts in our own backyard. The city has been and is, has been and is the backbone of our success. We believe that participating in and supporting the life of the Portland metro area is what we're all about at Nike. We're proud of our local, local partnerships with Oregon institutions like Self Enhancement Inc., SMART, Head Start, the Boys and Girls Club, and SOLVE. Through those partnerships and others across Oregon, we've given $2 million over the last year. Oregon is so fortunate to have leaders like Ron Herndon and Jack McGowan and Tony Hobson right here with us. Um, and we at Nike really greatly value those friendships and those partnerships. In 1984, we opened the first factory outlet store on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Since then, we have given a portion of the profits from that, sale, from that store to local charities. More than $700,000 so far have been given directly back into that community. This to Nike is not just good business, it's responsible business. Now in addition to investing in the community, we strongly believe that Oregon's wetlands and the natural beauty of our environment must be preserved and maintained. That's why last September, Phil Knight, Tom Clark, Jack McGowan from Solve, 
and over a thousand employees went out into the Oregon community, the Portland metro area, and did a cleanup project. We worked on the Albana Head Start uh, playground, we cleaned up uh, the Willamette Wilver and Sovi Island, and we worked on Forest Park preservation. It was all about demonstrating our commitment to corporate responsibility and showing that it starts really in the hearts and minds of every person at Nike. The concerns and needs of our environment are directly linked to the people who make up our workforce, and it truly extends beyond the berm, including our indelicate environment. So I just focused on a couple of very positive aspects of Nike and corporate responsibility, which is our commitment to communities and our commitment to the environment. Now we all know that Nike has been in the bullseye for another area of corporate responsibility, labor practices. It has been a great challenge to us at Nike. But as individuals, when we're challenged, we grow. And for Nike, we were challenged and we've grown as a company. So I like to say that for Nike, the labor issue has been a great opportunity and we're lucky that it came our way. <laughs> it's prepared us. I know that's a big statement. Phil doesn't like that statement. <laughs> but it's prepared us to be a great 21st century company. Most companies right now are behind the curve on corporate responsibility. Putting yourself in the hot seat or being put in the hot seat puts you ahead of the curve. So what's unique about Nike and corporate responsibility beyond being in the hot seat? First is that we've integrated it into the very fabric of everything we do as a company. I don't run the feel good division at Nike. We are not a group off on the side that makes everybody feel good that we're involved in the community or that we care about corporate responsibility. We have six top corporate priorities at Nike to run our business. Corporate responsibility is one of those objectives. As in all companies, the different divisions build their business plans based on those objectives. However, in our case, the corporate responsibility division's objectives are the business's objectives. We don't draft something different. So let me share with you the four key learnings that we've, we, that we've gone through at Nike on corporate responsibility. The first, as I just said, is that we make corporate responsibility a seamless part of the business. Now let me explain what that means in a day-to-day -day reality. When we adopted our environmental sustainability policy, we could have taken a standard approach. Take a group of employees, take them off, train them about the environment, and then they'll go back into their jobs and they'll be more environmentally aware. We said no, let's take them, let's create environmental champions throughout the company, give them the training, but then don't, don't let them forget it after two weeks, integrate it into every aspect of their job. So you're a footwear designer. You've been challenged by Nike to create the hottest, best performance footwear in the industry. We don't change your job, we just say, do all that, plus design in sustainability for the environment. So that means every part of that shoe you design has to be able to be recycled or go back into the natural food cycle of the environment. That's not easy, but it's a commitment that we've made and a commitment that shows that every employee at Nike is gonna have skin in the game when it comes to corporate responsibility. The second major learning that we have at Nike on corporate responsibility is to set a clear agenda and achieve it. Don't let others set the agenda for us. We need to be open about our process so that the world knows what we're up to. So Phil Knight committed us to delivering on six key initiatives back in May around labor practices. The first was increasing the age of workers in our factories, footwear factories to 18 and in apparel, equipment, and accessories to 16. That standard is well above what is traditionally, in many countries, the age of 14. What was important is that the world knows that we have zero tolerance for child labor. We've enacted that policy and it's in place, and if we find violations of it, we treat it very, very seriously. Secondly, we committed to ensuring that Nike contract footwear workers were protected at or below permissible OSHA air quality standards. That seems a little bit technical, but it's a very important point. It's one of the most important health risks of workers in the factories. 
and Nike committed to developing water-based solvents that now are used in 95% of our shoes. This is an incredible move forward for the health of workers in factories around the world and a commitment that we hope others will make as well. Next, we committed to building education and microloan programs for workers. And we have been putting those in place at a very rapid speed. And our fifth initiative was to expand our monitoring process to include NGOs, foundations, and educational institutions. We're going to make the summaries of those findings publics. public. We really believe that constant vigilance of consumers being able to know what really is what we say about go, what is going on in our factories really is what is going on in our factories. So this is a very important commitment that Nike has made to open up its process. Over the last year and a half, we have fired 10 factories in five countries. We're serious about continually improving the conditions in our factories and the lives of every single worker. Finally, Phil committed us to funding university research and open forums to explore issues related to global manufacturing. We just didn't think that the body of knowledge out in the community on this issue was as good as it needs to be. The point was to stimulate dialogue and encourage sharing of best practices between governments, NGOs, and companies, and across companies. So we set out to meet these six objectives, and I'm very proud of our team. It's been an incredible year, but we have delivered on every single one of those objectives. So what are the things that we're doing moving forward? Today we're announcing an increase in Indonesian wages. We have worked with students and faculty at Dartmouth's, Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business, as well as other experts that have provided us with wage information about purchasing power data for our workers in Indonesia. In August of 98, a wage study done by the Tuck School reported to us that 100% inflation in food and other products had eroded the buying powder, power of Indonesian citizens. So in October of 98, we raised wages of those workers by 25% in footwear factories. We've committed at that time to monitor the situation very closely. Unfortunately, the economic picture has not improved. So therefore, effective April 1st, when the Indonesian government is scheduled to increase its minimum wage, Nike will increase its cash, cash wage for entry-level workers from 250,000 to 260,000 5,000 rupiah. <coughs> Let me place this in context. In Indonesia, the current minimum wage is 200,000 rupiah, and with many citizens in the country unfortunately making far below that figure or unemployed. So we're using a combination of cash wage, bonus, free subsidized meals, and housing allowances to bring Nike worker salaries up to 332 rupiah. Now, most workers earn a lot more than that. The perception is that most workers earn that entry salary. On average, 70% of Nike workers make much more than that, 400,000 rupiah or more. So these new wage levels are consistent with our own continuing research and also match studies conducted by N independent NGOs, such as Global Exchange, uh, where Medea Benjamin is located. So we recognize and accept our responsibility to pay good wages and create safe working conditions. So setting clear objectives on the critical issues and meeting them is clear. Our third learning focuses on our employees. I believe there's no such thing as a company. A company is just a collection of people who all care about individuals who work in our factories, people who have convictions, people who have frustrations, and that's what Nike is. It's a collection of people who care about the kind of business that we run. So one of the most important aspects of this labor issue had to do with our employees. More than anyone, when this issue hit, it was our employees that were hurt by the accusations against Nike. It questioned not the quality of our product, but our integrity and our character. We want and need every employee at Nike to feel good about Nike's corporate responsibility record. 
and we want them all to feel integrated into our corporate responsibility process. Nike is their company, and we don't want them to feel like they're on the sidelines when it comes to corporate responsibility. So no more bat and down hatches at Nike. We are open and clear about what we're doing, and we want to have a dialogue that includes everyone on issues of corporate responsibility. The fourth and final learning is that old style thinking to see the critical community as adversaries is a mistake. Governor Tom McCall saw the influx of Californians which inspired the bumper sticker, Welcome to Oregon, Please Go Home. Well, that's kind of how Phil saw this issue. He saw that we were running good factories and what we really saw is that it was, became an issue that we really underestimated what the impact would be. So just as Oregon has opened up to the neighboring world and become a major Pacific Rim trading partner, Nike has come to realize something of value is to be gained from the voices of the outside world. You mentioned Medea Benjamin, and in my first days on the job, in fact, I got on a plane and flew to San Francisco and sat down with Medea Benjamin who had said absolutely incredible things about Nike and we had said absolutely incredible things about her. And it was a very difficult meeting and I went into that meeting with the goal of finding some shred of common ground between Medea Benjamin and Nike. And after a very difficult discussion, we agreed at the end that we did share something. We shared a common concern for the workers in our factories and the improvement of their life. And with that small, shred of common understanding over the year, the last year, we have built a level of trust. And that has made all the difference in the world because with openness and trust and understanding, we have been able to build an opportunity to really exchange solid information and make solid judgments together. So the wage announcement that, just, that I just made, we've talked to Medea Benjamin about that. The disclosure issue that you mentioned earlier, we've talked to her about that. We have to drive a strong agenda on our own, and we do that, but we really know that we have to listen to others, and in that process, we will learn and become better. So we hope that others will come to know us better and work with us in challenging the norms and pushing the envelope when it comes to corporate responsibility. We're good at challenging at Nike, and that's what people have come to expect of us. We want to be involved in partnerships and that challenge, partnerships that are going to challenge convention and create innovation. 25 years ago, Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman and their team were pioneers in an undefined industry. Today we're all pioneers, but of a different kind. We're moving beyond building a business. We're global pioneers helping build a sustainable, responsible world economy. All of us at Nike and all of you as leaders in this community are integral to the global economy. It's up to all of us in our communities, whether in Portland or Coochie, Vietnam or Indonesia, to create sustainable, responsible communities. We want everybody who purchases and wears a Nike product created by this Oregon company to feel good about Nike and corporate responsibility. The Nike spirit will continue to live on in Hayward Field, on basketball courts, soccer fields, playgrounds all over the world. But today we have an expanded challenge. That's in the world at large, in our communities, and in the workplace. If we can lead the way in showing the world that corporate responsibility is not only good for people, but good for business, then we'll have created something beyond the Air Jordan and the swoosh. Together with you, we will help to create a better world, even if we never build over the Eidner State 405 freeway. We've grown from those first days when Phil Knight sold shoes out of his trunk at track meets. We've grown into a global corporation with 20,000 people making the world's best athletic footwear and apparel. We've grown into a company that embraces its responsibilities at home in Oregon and across the globe. That's Nike. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.
Before t uh, taking questions, could I just introduce very quickly a number of the Nike people that are here today, just so we have more faces with names. But Gina Warren is our new director of community affairs at Nike, joining us from Levi's and move, move from California to Oregon, and we want you to stay. Uh, Sarah Severn. Sarah is our director of Nike's environmental action team, working with all kinds of organizations around the world, including the Natural Step to, and others to build our environmental action team. Lee Weinstein. I think many of you know Lee, who is very active in, in the Portland community. He's our director of communications at Nike. And uh, Veda Manager. Veda is our director of global issues management. Veda has had the pleasure of handling the media on the labor issue. And, and anybody who knows can just imagine what this man's life has been like. <laughs> uh, and Fukumi Hauser, Fukumi is right there. Fukumi is our senior labor practice manager for training and compliance. And Fukumi has de developed some of the most innovative work in training in factories of, of different multicultural uh, Korean Korean, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, it's really an innovative uh, program she's developed and we're really proud of what she's doing there. Lindsay Stewart, Lindsay, are you here? Oh, I lost you, there you are. Lindsay's our general counsel at Nike and a long time, I think originally even born in Portland, po possibly, so he's very homegrown, okay? And um, <laughs> Jim Carter, Jim is here as well. There you are, Jim. Uh, General Counsel to the U.S. and America's region. Also works very closely with us on all the labor practices issues. And, and born in yeah, there you go. <laughs> and Keith Peters d d doesn't want to be introduced, but it's a big day for us at Nike because I believe it's the first time all of us here from Nike have ever seen him in a tie. So we want to point that out. <laughs> okay. And finally, for the Duck fans, Juliet Moran, are you here? All right, there's Juliet. She's one of our many University of Oregon graduates. She's our vice president of running at Nike. <laughs> so there are other Nike people here as well, but I wanted to highlight those individuals because I'd like everybody to get to know us better at Nike. Um, and now I'd be happy to take questions. Maria, thank you for coming today, and it's good to see as many Nike employees here to support you. Um, my question is this, with uh, the global economy and everything changing as much as it is, what specific corporate responsibility action items should take place? I'll make sure I understand your question. With the global, the changes in the global economy, what should we be doing? Globally, what should we be doing globally for the corporate responsibility issues? Well, I think it goes from local to global. And I think that a company cannot see its responsibilities as one or the other. It's all about seeing the whole continuum of responsibilities. And I think what I've tried to talk about is how we care about the most local of communities and every individual within the company. And then we also care about the impact we're having on the global economy, other companies, and that each, each step in that process really matters. So I think that what, what it's really all about is setting very aggressive agendas to deal with these issues as opposed to stepping back and letting them, letting them just move forward as they would. I think it's what we're, what we're doing right now is setting a clear agenda and then working on that agenda. We can't solve every issue involved in global manufacturing or the global economy every step of the way, but we can, make, we can slowly build a, a process to deal with those issues. Hi, I have an Oregon question for you. Steve Novick, City Club member. In 1996, Nike contributed $15,000 and Phil Knight contributed $5,000 personally to the campaign against Measure 47, the property tax cut measure largely responsible for our current school funding problems. Businesses and individuals as a whole contributed $300,000 and organized labor contributed $1.7 million. We lost, but it was close. In the year 2000, Sizemore is going to have a billion dollar income tax cut measure on the ballot, which will require a 10% cut in all state services, including education. It's more beatable than Measure 47 was, but it'll still take a $2 million campaign. Unfortunately, organized labor won't have $1.7 million because Sizemore will have other initiatives on the ballot specifically attacking unions. My question for you is, can you take back the message to Nike that the best investment you can make in Oregon in the year 2000 is to contribute a $1 million to beating Bill Sizemore's tax cut and saving Oregon schools? <laughs> 
yes, I can take that message back. <laughs> Can't make any promises, but I'll take that message back. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Parrish, City Club member. I commend you on your efforts at Nike, by the way. Um, one of the things in Indonesia, of course, that affects a lot of the folks in your in plants is the rapid flow of capital. It moves from one country quickly to another, and many people ask the question, where is the capital all going? Uh, last week, the Willamette Week had a story, and it was titled Window Dressing, and it's on their website at wweek.com, and it's also on my website at billparish.com. My question is this. The idea is, where is all this capital going? Well, if it were discovered that this capital was primarily being concentrated in one company that has a market valuation of half a trillion dollars and gross sales of 17, and that it was a result of legal yet unethical financial practices, could Nike, Phil Knight, and that just do it, can do it attitude, take on the Microsoft Corporation and thereby contribute to more stability in the global economic marketplace? <laughs> oh, gee, you know, I thought had issues dealing with the labor issue. <laughs> That's uh, we, very germane. Right. I've, I've been to many of those countries, and I've, I've, I've been to Honduras and all those places. Absolutely. I think capital flows is an absolute key issue in the global economy right now. Um, I think that uh, I don't want to speculate on any potential uh, issues like that, but it's what's, I think what's important is to be clear about what the parameter of a company's responsibilities are. And mm -hmm. right now, we're really focused on what we're trying to do to build a strong corporate responsibility agenda at Nike. And I think we, uh, each company has to deal with its own responsibilities. And uh, so I don't, want, I don't want to get into speculating about getting into Microsoft's issues. Well, knowing, knowing that Phil started out as an accountant, I might suggest that he read it. <laughs> OK. Uh, Herb Goodman, City Club member. I have a two-part question. The first is, would you like to give, give us some specific examples of how Nike has improved uh, workers' uh, situation in foreign countries. And the second part is, how do you compare with your competitors in this area? OK, in terms of specific improvements, there are a lot of them. But um, one of which I mentioned today was the improvement in the air quality in the factories, which is a huge improvement in terms of worker safety. The, our code of conduct has been something that, that we actively enact within, the, within the, the, the factories. And just by the fact that we've let some factories go, clearly we're raising the standard on a continual basis in those factories. It's all about the day-to-day -day life of those workers. We've created an education program in our fit, footwear factories so that uh, workers have an opportunity to have an education that when they leave the factory and go on in their life, they have another opportunity beyond that. We've um, <coughs> raised wages, like I say, in Indonesia. And we continue to look at that issue. There's a whole, ho I can keep going if you want me to. There's, a, there's just a whole host of things that we've done that are continually improving the conditions in the factories. Looking at other companies, I would just ask you all to ask other companies what they're doing, just like so many people have been asking us what we've been doing. Thank you. Joella Whirlin, club member and also a member of Global Exchange. And your presentation is very heartwarming and very exciting to those of us who have been following some of these issues for a while. Um, I want to know whether your spokespersons, your, your famous sports players and others who have so notably been indifferent to carrying this message are now going to be carrying the message of corporate responsibility and global responsibility and consumer responsibility to the young people who buy your products? Well, it's really up to, to each individual athlete to do what he or she would like to do and, and to attack issues that they would like to attack. Michael Jordan will be going to Asia to look at the factories. Uh, he now runs the Jordan business. He's the CEO of that business. It's important to him to understand and see where his product is made and under what conditions. So there is a real commitment uh, within the Nike family, as we like to call it, to look at these issues and to be actively involved. Andy Linehan, City Club member. You've talked a lot about improving conditions, including worker salaries at your overseas manufacturing locations. Are you working at all in developing institutional capabilities in your overseas operations, i.e., development of managerial talents that will be useful in the development of those economies? One of the biggest initiatives that we have going is the one that Fukumi is leading, which is to train 
individuals within the factories to move up within the management ranks. It's a key initiative for us. It's not one that you would normally read about every day in coverage about Nike and the labor issue, but what we're doing is working with line workers, hoping to get them up to the supervisor level, we work with supervisors, trying to get them up to the management level so that we have local grown talent working within the factories and then hopefully those people will go out and work in the local economies because we really believe that the best thing we can do with those factories is support those local economies to develop better and better jobs. <clears throat> Dan Goldie, City Club member. Um, <clears throat> the, there's a growing isolationist movement, particularly reflected in the Congress right now, in part being fed by the Asian economic problem and our trade imbalances, our trade deficit. There is key legislation before the Congress, depending on its outcome, will, will determine whether companies like Nike can continue to operate as they have in the past. Would you like to comment, or would you comment, on what Nike is doing in concert with other companies to try to maintain the free trade international global approach to the economy that we've had and that has contributed so much to our prosperity heretofore. And what if that fails in the Congress, if we go the other way, it would mean to a company like Nike? Well, I might have to ask Lindsay Stewart to help me on this. If I, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give it a shot. Um, we have uh, active government affairs efforts that go on in Washington, D.C. Brad Feigl, our Director of Government and Trade Affairs in Washington, is actively involved daily uh, working on these kinds of issues to ensure that we have a, a very supportive and positive uh, uh, government environment so that we can continue to grow our business. We also have an individual in uh, Brussels who works on these issues from a Brussels perspective, and even have somebody in Vietnam who works on issues there. So we really see our government affairs efforts as critical to really maintaining our ability to run a strong business in the global economy. Okay. You have anything to add? No, I, other than that we have recognized from very, very early stages that this was as critical as a uh, importer of products. And we've had our Washington, D.C. office uh, as a functioning lobbying facility since uh, 1978, I believe. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm Gus a member of the club. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, last winter, there were some newspaper stories, and I must confess I couldn't quite follow them all, uh, about a, an executive at Nike who wrote a letter, I think it was to the Vietnamese government, uh, which was then, quote, leaked, unquote to the newspapers there, and they got into the Oregonian, and I never did get a chance to read the whole letter, so I'm not exactly sure what he said. But it led to, uh, I don't know, I guess embarrassment, is that right, at Nike? I'm Mis not sure. Misunderstanding. misunderstanding. A, lot of mis a lot of misunderstanding. I was wondering whether you could set this episode sure. uh, straight for us, because I got lost. Maybe first you can describe what the letter was. Uh, there was a letter written by uh, an individual vice president within Nike uh, to, in, to Vietnam, and, uh, the Vietnamese government, talking about uh, relationships with NGOs. And the letter was inconsistent with our policy, which is something I've been talking about today, which is our relationship with NGOs and how much we value them, NGOs being non-governmental organizations. So what is very clear is that Nike has had a consistent policy about participation of NGOs in its process and the way we approach our work with NGOs is to see them as extremely valuable and important as to how we run our business. In the environment, for example, Sarah Severn and her team has spent innumerable hours working with non-governmental organizations developing our policy and implementing it. In the labor practices area, we've built our programs such as our microloan programs with non-governmental organizations in, very, in Vietnam, the same country where the letter went. So really what we had was a letter that was written that was not consistent with the policy and so we just wanted to make that clear so that everybody understands what Nike's policy is, which is that we value uh, the, the role that non-governmental organizations have to play. 
Hi, I'm Diane Mitchell, City Club member. Um, I would like to ask you a little bit about that transition phase that you were talking, you mentioned um, for foreign workers. Uh, how long, for, for example, um, do they generally work at a Nike factory? Uh, years ago, when I was in some, doing some labor research, um, there were cases, not particularly with Nike, but with other corporations, where sometimes recruiting processes, uh, they would go out to the rural areas and bring in young girls into the factories. And then they may only work four or five years at that factory, and the transition for them was often into prostitution, rather than it back into a normal life. So I was just wondering, what are the conditions of women in those factories? Absolutely. About 80% of the workers in Nike contract factories are, factories are women. On average, they stay uh, in the factory for about two to four years. And it is common for those women to have an opportunity, that's an opportunity to come from the rural environment and work in the factory to de develop some of their own income. And for the first time in their life, often uh, have income on their own uh, that is not controlled by a brother or a father. So in a lot of ways, these jobs are an incredible opportunity for these young women. And it's important that they don't go on to other trades. And that's why we've done things like create our education program. But at the same time, we work very hard on training, like I say with Fukumi, because we want to create these jobs to be the best possible jobs they can be so that people then can go on, the young, young women who have those jobs and the young men then can go on to other sectors of their economy or stay within the factory environment and have opportunities there. The lines around Nike factories, when there are jobs available, loop the factories, where there are about five to 10,000 well, workers. So these are very coveted jobs in, in those economies, actually. Let me ask an, a, a question while we're waiting for the next questioner. Um, excuse me. Uh, you mentioned 40% uh, uh, pay raise. Perhaps it was 25% pay raise in Indonesia. I wonder, one of the big issues, as I understand it, has been the, has been the pay scale overseas. Um, with 100% inflation and a 25% pay raise, obviously there's a shortage there. Can you comment on the purchasing power of the wages you pay in Asia and how that compares now to what it was a few years ago? Okay. The wage issue is such a complex issue and such an important issue. And um, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to start rattling off a bunch of economic figures of how you calculate wages and what their comparative value is. One of the things we've tried to do is understand the wage in a simpler way. What does a Nike worker make in comparison to a farmer or to a policeman? And see where does a Nike worker sit on that spectrum? And, gen and farmer or worker makes less money than a, Nike, than a Nike worker does. And so we're trying to use that kind of data to help us understand the context of the issue, and then very hard economic data, like I mentioned about the Tuck study and others that have been done. One of the issues is, that has been raised so heavily is the living wage issue. The problem with that issue is that everyone decides, defines a living wage in a different way. Should a uh, worker be responsible for supporting a family of five people? That's a big question. So when we start to analyze this issue, you almost have to start a process of peeling the onion before you get to a point where you have a common language of what you're talking about. The important thing is that we're committed to paying a wage that allows people to save, to purchase, and to have a, a fair wage that provides them with a fair opportunity to build some savings and to have a good experience working in the factory and the potential for other jobs after that. So I think that there's a real necessity to study it further, to do the right thing in Indonesia and other places where you have an extreme situation develop. And that'll just be, continue to be a very important issue. Don Wagner, member of the club. And uh, very uh, heartening to hear the, the words that you're bringing to us. But I'm surprised that there is such a short uh, working career for these people. If, if uh, the lines are all the way around the plant, and, and you presumably then are only hiring a relatively few people, they come in, they make what's a very good wage, and then by my stars, they're, they're there a very short time. Is that a problem? Do you, uh, do you, do you see that there's something that has to be done differently? Well, actually, a couple things that are interesting about that is a lot of, a lot of workers want to go back to their, uh, their local community. 
a lot of workers go on to get married and really came with the intention of only working there for, for that period of time with a very specific goal of making some savings and then going back or going on to get married in, in the case of a lot of the young women. But uh, the other thing that we're finding is as we have worked very hard to improve the conditions in the factories, the worker retention rates do go up and we're finding that we do have better worker retention. And that is just a great example of how running a, a more responsible business creates a better business. It's very expensive to train workers. And as we have to continually turn over the workforce and train, it's a big expense. So as we create a better workforce and we have workers that are more content with those jobs and see the, the continuum of where they can develop with them, we really find that we do have less turnover in the factories. I'm Margaret Fine, and I'm interested in the role that corporate responsibility plays in shaping the messages and images of Nike's advertising. Well, Nike advertising, I'm not sure anybody can explain that. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to go there. Um, Nike advertising is its, own, it's, it's, it's its own animal, and I think it, it takes any kind of form. And it's, I think Phil said that if, it's, if, it's, uh, if people aren't noticing it, then we're failing. So um, we've actually done a, a number of ads that are really exciting in terms of corporate responsibility. I don't know if people have seen the If You Let Me Play ads. Uh, which were really uh, about uh, empowering young girls to get involved in sports, which helps keep them out of trouble. Um, there's other ads, the Charles Barkley ad, I'm not a role mo model. If you look at the history of Nike advertising, you'll find a lot of really interesting examples of corporate responsibility messages. I don't think we ever want to get in the position where corporate responsibility is dictating our advertising, but, uh, but it certainly has been, an, it has been a theme uh, throughout the history of Nike. Nikki Lynch, I'm a member. Um, getting kind of back from this global to local, uh, does Nike have a policy, f you know, you mentioned Solve and, and various things that you're supporting, but is there a policy that you can sort of spell out to us in terms of supporting local things, you know, like the arts or whatever, you know, is it just sort of random, like who asks the most or? <laughs> no, I, I should hope it's not random. Uh, no, it's, we have um, really focused on empowering young people and giving them the opportunity to be involved in sports and then also on education, very heavily on education, heavily on the environment. And uh, Gina Warren, who I introduced yesterday, is working uh, very hard on re-communicating out to the community what kinds of things that we support at Nike. And I think that's really important because people do need to understand it's very hard to say no. And we hate to say no, but unfortunately, when you're part of a local community, uh, a state community, a region community, a U.S. community, and then the global community, uh, it's very hard to meet all of those needs well. So what we really want to do is be as focused as possible and help as many kids as possible because that is our bottom line focus. Um, and and I, I think that that is really the kind of focus that we have globally as well as locally. Thank you very much, Maria. When she introduced herself to me, I asked how to pronounce her name, and she says, as in idol. Well, she's been with Nike only a year, and you see all the things that have been done. She certainly hasn't been idle. We appreciate you uh, coming here to talk to us and all of, uh, all of your associates. So we'll see you next week for Fred Hansen, the director of TriMet, to talk about South North. Thank you for coming. <laughs>